This video is proudly sponsored by Gamersgate. Download games anytime, anywhere. Visit Gamersgate.com. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to ElderGeek.com's Spoiler Alert. Uh, Spoiler Alert is actually a show where we talk in depth about the story of uh, a game. And uh, with me today, I have Gavin Green, our news editor here at Elder Geek. Hey, everybody. And special guest, Kaiser Neko, director and editor of uh, Dragon Ball Z Abridged. Hello there. Why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, your, uh, your show there? Hey, uh, well, basically, uh, me and a team of writers and voice actors take the original Dragon Ball Z series and cut it down, re-script it, revoice it, you know, just re- like, Basically, we use all the footage to make it a comedy series. Uh, it's been running for about three and a half, four years now, and we're up to 420,000 subscribers on YouTube. Cool. Major. Uh, okay, so this episode, this is sort of a reimagining of the show. We actually had this show a few years ago where we did basically the same thing, uh, but we talked about a game at, uh, at length a little bit more. Uh, this show is going to be more about just the story part of each game, and this time we are talking about Mass Effect 3. Um, now, Mass Effect 3 has had a lot of controversy around it the last couple of weeks, maybe even a month. Uh, but instead of jumping on top of the whole heaping pile of uh, controversy, basically, uh, we decided to wait a little bit and let everything die down and let people have played the game themselves as much as possible before we start spoiling it. So um, with that said, uh, I'm just going to toss it off to you, Gavin. What was your personal shepherd like? Personal shepherd. Almost sounds religious. Um, let's see. I, I was playing my female femshep paragon, whose name is... Uh, Jessica Shepard, and uh, I had to retool the face since I started pretty early and Bioware has still not come up with a patch to import your face from Mass Effect 2, so I ended up with kind of a mix between Felicia Day and Daria Morgendorfer, so that's what my uh, Shepard looked like, and in terms of previous decisions from the last games, I went full Paragon as much as I could, so save the Rack Knight Queen, um, save the Council, put uh, Captain Anderson as the uh, council representative, all that stuff. And same thing for Mass Effect 2. I did kill Rex only because I don't know why. So I did have a sprinkling of Renegade in there, but otherwise I'm full Paragon. And I romanced Caden in the first game and Garrus in the second and third. Nice. Uh, personally, I played a female Shepard as well. Uh, I sort of went mixed Renegade and, um, and Paragon, uh, whereas... I tried to sort of adopt this whole chaotic, neutral attitude to everything. So I always did what suited me best without going out of my way to be evil. Um, but I did save the Rachni Queen. I saved the cancel, uh, cancel because I figured that would, in the long run, benefit humanity the most. Um, I put Anderson on the council just because Eudena is obviously a prick. Um, and uh, and I romanced Liara. Uh, I, I sort of designed my character to be a hothead, so she was a redhead, obviously, because that stereotype just works in my head for some reason. And uh, her name was Alex Shepard, so short for Alexis, I guess. Hmm. How about you, Nico? Nico, sorry. Uh, that's all right. Uh, for me, I actually was one of those boring people who didn't, you know, mess with the face at all, and I, I picked a male Shepard. Um, I think, really, it all came down to the fact that I just like that face on him that that just works for me i've seen yeah. a lot of personally made shepherds and none of them have looked like they fit the voice which is funny because a lot of my friends say well i don't think the voice fits the face and i'm like well you know i guess it's going to vary from person to person um as for his alignment it was definitely paragon um i, I definitely took the approach of i'm going to make sure that i serve everyone's best interest and I, I i wanted to help people that's his entire the entire purpose of my shepherd was that you know he wanted to uh do the right thing no matter what uh even when even when he knew it was gonna bite him in the ass uh the only few times i ever took the renegade option is uh like <laughs> in three actually um i shot odina because i was like oh screw it i just bam done mm -hmm. um and like i i ha unfortunately it almost forces you to take one uh, near, in, in the ending if you didn't do something right, which is kind of frustrating to me, but I'll get into that later. 
but... You bring but, up yeah. an interesting... Sorry. Go, go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say, you bring up an interesting point, because uh, in the third game, I really didn't feel like the 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 differences between Paragon and Renegade were that clear. Uh, like you mentioned, when you shoot at Udina, uh, I, I don't know, it's just me that thought, thought that, you know, you basically had no choice if you wanted everything to L as, uh, end the best uh, way possible. Uh, I just thought Udina was a dick for the first game, so I took the first chance I shot. Uh, I could to shoot him in the head and get him out of my game. Mm. I guess I, I guess I. Sh oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Uh, I guess I should have, uh, you know, trusted in the game to not let Udina do what he was about to do. Um, I I should have trusted that. Oh, maybe Caden will shoot him, or Ashley will shoot him. Actually, I had Ashley during that one. Um, and as it turns out, you know. If you do not pick the Renegade during that point, uh, during that part, either uh, Ashley or Caden, depending on who you saved, will shoot Udina. Mm. For me, I was I all I could think was I have to save the Asari uh, uh, counselor. Was it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the Asari counselor, and so I shot Udina. And mm. in the end, I was like, well, you know, I, my shepherd would have done that anyway. So it's not like it's not like. I, I just didn't feel that that was a renegade option. I felt like, how is that supposed to be renegade? I'm saving somebody's life. It's not like it's not like there was a non-violent solution to that problem. Exactly, and I, I kind of feel like, uh, you know, you mentioned where, where you had to trust the game to sort it all out for itself, thereby having Ashley or Caden shoot, uh, shoot Redina. I feel like, you know, that sort of destroys the immersion of the game. If you really have to think about what's happening in the background of the game instead of, you know, the immediate situation, then... You know, yeah. yeah. I will say, I will say, those are few and far between, though. Like, just, almost, yeah. Like that—that that was the one that stuck out to me the most. I mean, in the second one, I get uh, that you have some renegade options. For example, where you kick the guy through the window. I—I I was a mixed. Uh, I was a mixed uh, sort of shepherd where I did everything, uh, like I said, chaotic neutrally. But sometimes, you know, you just want to be a little bit of a dick, and if it's an enemy, it's an enemy, and you know. He picked the wrong side, basically. <laughs> I believe I believe there was a part in the second one where there's that one guy who alerts the rest of the soldiers on uh, on the one planet where you're looking for uh, Grunt, and you're like you give him the option, he's like, screw it, and then you have the option to shoot him. I think I took that one. Yeah, you also you also can uh, convince him to lead them into an ambush because uh, yeah. he um, they radio him and ask for uh, you know the Krogan position or whatever mm -hmm. and then you can tell him to send them in in the wrong direction or yeah. uh, basically shoot him I don't think I've ever done a full good or bad game uh, game run through in my entire life I don't, I, don't, I don't know if it's possible to do a completely good one because there will always be that one little uh, evil renegade etc option that will always tease you enough to indulge at least once. Yeah. Yeah. Also with also with Mass Effect uh, two and three, where you have the uh, the little uh, prompts on the left and right corner, uh, where you could do a renegade or or, or paragon option. Sometimes you just click that out of instinct without really thinking about what it's going to do. Yeah, I played Dragon. I played Dragon Slayer quite frequently in my youth, so I, I'm kind of honed to any sort of flashing prompts. Yeah. Right? And that's it was a bit detrimental, I have to say. Mm hmm. But uh, moving on, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, about all the new characters because unlike in um, well, I wouldn't I shouldn't say unlike in Mass Effect 2, but um, you sort of got when you got when you were finished with Mass Effect 2, you you got this impression that you were gonna take that same team with you to Mass Effect 3 and finish the fight with those same characters, and more or less that's not entirely true because I mean you have like two or three characters from the previous games as full time crew members and the rest of sort of just appear once in a while in the game. Which I actually have a theory on. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, basically, the th okay, so the first game is, is to really set everything up. Uh, set the story, the universe, the lore. The second game really was a way to flesh out that universe and find out more about it. Um, and if you'll notice in that second game, you don't get as much interaction with the, the all the all the characters you had in one, um, like Liara. Liara is suddenly put in the background, uh, you know, trying to find the Shadow Broker, and we finally get to actually play with her in the the DLC, the Shadow Broker. Mm -hmm. um, Garrus and Tally even take a little bit of a step back, 
Uh, although Tally gets a full mission, gets you know, I, I feel like Pally really uh, got the most development in, in two. Mm. Um, and we got to meet a whole bunch of new characters in two, who in the third game are not playable characters. They do not follow you. And I feel like that was that's because the third game is supposed to come back. It's supposed to bring everything back in that one. And it's I, I think they were really trying to say, okay, these are your main people. Um, Rex can't come back because that's just unfortunately Rex being a playable character alongside you was just not gonna be an option thanks to the decisions you make in the first game. Right. Um, yeah. Not to, and not also, to mention, you yeah, know, he like, could die in the first one. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I understood, and I was completely okay with the fact that Morden, Jacob, Miranda, uh, uh, Jack, none of those guys. No, uh, they they were they were not your party members, especially when it came to Thane. Thane was sick, and he'd been sick for like, he, he, you know, his doctor gave him six months to live a year ago. Mm. So it's kind of understandable he's not in the place to be a party member. Right. And and watching Jack actually have students and to watch her story arc come to a close was actually far more satisfying than her going on adventures with Shepard. Not to mention the way uh, Morden uh, appeared in the game. Right. Morden's character arc is one of the m most moving. Ah, oh, man. Yeah. I think I I'm going to go so far as to say it's one of the best written characters I've seen in a video game in a long time. Easily. Easily. Yeah. Yeah. But I think uh, to bump off uh, Kaiser's theory here, I think, yeah, I, I think it was this noted design decision from the get go, or as soon as they knew they were going to plan a trilogy here. I thought really every character you had in the second game had that complete arc, especially if you invested the time into it. And to bring them back in full capacity for the third game would just be a repetitive decision in which they have to start a brand new arc, and whereas bringing back the revolving door and having new characters allows you to just revisit and maybe add a small little epilogue to your old characters. Um, I always thought that was a purposeful decision. I thought it worked well. I didn't want to risk uh, highlighting over the same things that we did in the last game just to have all everyone's favorite character back in playable form. Yeah. Yeah. And like you said, I mean, that, it was built in like a lot of characters. Thane was dying. Morden always mentioned his last decade. And everyone else had ties back to their own, uh, their own home planets. So, I mean, they built it up. It made sense. Exactly. And, and yeah, exactly. Because um, uh, the Severians as well, you know, they only live, what is it, 40 years, isn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah so, 30 to 40, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, in order to become a, an accomplished scientist, you basically have to be at the end of your lifetime anyway. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and generally but, speaking, the, the two characters that got the most fandom, uh, got Garrus and Tally, remained on through the entire series. I mean, they didn't even have a romance option in the first one until the fans really started telling Bioware it would be awesome, and that's when their characters really exploded in the second game. So they, ca they Bioware understood who people really, really wanted, and they dumped Jacob. Always a good exactly. idea. Oh, oh yeah, Jacob, if you'll notice, Jacob is so unimportant in number three. He doesn't even have the option to die. Yeah. <laughs> yes, oh, that is here, true. Here's a funny little tidbit. I actually killed off Jacob in the second game because I I loathed him so much. <laughs> he, was <laughs> he was the only he was so, the only character I killed off in 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 the, in the second game. And funnily enough, at the uh, at near the end of the third game, uh, you can actually walk into a a room when you sort of group up on Earth with everyone. And have like a comm officers get you to contact all the previous right. uh, members of, of of your crew from the second game. And even though I killed off Jacob, this is a mistake Bioware has made. He was actually available to talk to. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, that's, that, actually, that's, that's pretty good. That's bad yeah. to happen now. Uh, yeah, I my the the completionist in me led me to complete Jacob's little subroutine uh, in Mass Effect 2 just because it was there and it was mm. part of the story. But I haven't seen. Uh, they don't. No one hates Jacob. No one likes Jacob. I've never seen a character. It's it's uh, like Caden in the first reaction. game. Yeah, I, I guess so. But even more. I mean, up until you know his uh, his romantic subplot where he goes the the prize. Until that became you know a kind of meme thing. There was nothing to the Jacob character that anyone in the fan community latched onto. Yeah, he's he's incredibly white bread. <laughs> incredibly. <laughs> I, I remember I remember one of the running joke that I had with all of my friends was he's a black Caden. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, unfortunately, he doesn't have Karth voice, so... <laughs> yeah. Oh. Uh, but I think, going back to the new character, uh, I felt James Vega was kind of filling in for Jacob in the sense that he wasn't as intriguing or interesting as any of the other characters, we, uh, any of the new characters in Mass Effect 3. All I really focused on him was his trapezius muscles. Those little <laughs> bulges behind his neck. It was just so freakish. Yeah. So it I'm shows... like, God, man! And yeah, they even go as far as to show him working out most of the time. And it's like, look, if you're trying to prove that he actually works out and doesn't take steroids, fine. I don't know. I feel like I feel like I don't know. I feel like they needed a character. Uh, they needed a new human character, and that was the best they could do. Personally, I just I don't like the human characters. I mean, I'm a I have a ship full of cool alien species. Why would I take some boring human with me on a party? <laughs> well, the, the, the one I actually like, if, if we have to go by human characters we like, I always loved Jack. Hmm. Jack, Jack was incredibly fascinating to me, mostly because of her sense of humor, and mostly because she she was so flawed. And that's not something you got with Miranda, or with Jacob, or with Kaden. The only, in fact, I remember the first time I played Mass Effect through, I let Ashley die because I was like, Ashley, you're a xenophobic bitch. Exactly, and uh, a little bit pious. A little bit pious. Uh, but guess what? The second time I played it through, and why I have her in the third game, is I remembered, you know what? She may be flawed, but at least she's interesting. Exactly. What has Caden got? Oh, my teacher was abusive. I, I have I have headaches because of an implant in me. And I could yeah. get a new one, but then I wouldn't be as badass. <laughs> yeah, I was like, you know what, Caden? Well, just... do, you guys, do you guys think, I think we're focusing a bit too much on the prequels, but do you, uh, Scott, I know uh, a lot of people thought Caden was really white bread. I, not, me, not me so much. I don't know, maybe because I liked the voice actor a lot, but um, what do you think about his arc in Mass Effect 3? Or did you have, uh, you had Ashley, right? Yeah, unfortunately I had Ashley. Although, if I can't touch on one, you know, if, if we're talking about three and new characters, and especially romance, there's something I'd really like to bring up about this. Yeah. Um, so, in the third game, Bioware, uh, I, I'm going to flat out, flat out say that they gave into pressure on this one. And oh, yeah. it, I, I definitely think it has a little bit to do with Miss Hepler. They introduced homosexual relationships. Male, uh, let me, let me, let me correct myself, male homosexual relationships. Two, right? If I'm not mistaken? No, in three, in three. Oh, no, no, no. You mean, yeah, in three, there were two. Yes. There was Cortez, a character who, I'm not going to lie, not that interesting. Um, he, he, he had a moment, but once, you know, he said, I got over I got over it, and I'm healing. You're like, okay, bye. Yeah. I'm sorry. That, yeah. I was going to say, I never really uh, felt like I should care. Um, you know, he was talking about how he lost his husband and, right. and everything, and... Uh, since I mean, if it was Doctor Chakwas or someone you had known throughout the series, uh, then I probably would care. But he's a new character, and you know, a bunch of people probably lost their loved ones in in, in the wars. Uh, right. And I, I just I don't I, I I I empathize sort of, but you know, for a moment, and then I forget about it. I don't go around. You know, I, I kind of felt this was annoying every time he would bring that up instead of just giving me the mission stats or whatever. So. Uh, did you think it was because he wasn't playable? That he wasn't part of your squad? Do you think that Maybe. has any relation to it? I mean... Maybe. Uh, I, 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 I don't think... think it was because he wasn't part of the, the other two games. I, yeah, I think I had the same relationship with you guys saying Cortez in terms of reaction that I do both of your uh, communication specialists. Uh, you had... God, the redhead in Mass Effect 2 that... I Kelly, have Chambers. Kelly Chambers. Kelly Chambers, who unfortunately died in my playthrough that I was playing with Jessica. Uh, ditto. Uh, but yeah. I have I, my Renegade playthrough. She's alive. Um, but I lost Legion in that playthrough, so I'm a little bit skeptical of, of booting that back up. And then in this one, you had Trainer, who had even less interesting uh, bit. Uh, had even a le less interesting arc than uh, Chambers, I thought. And I think that's just because but you developed such a interesting dynamic to those characters that you can control and play with and play and go to battle with and those that are simply i guess narrative dressing inside the ship well you know look at joker i mean you never got to play with them but actually you did mass effect 2 you had that little segment where you could play joker for that little bit little brief time and you had that little uh joke with Edie. ah true yeah but primarily you never got to play as him and um 
but you and... can build relationships, a exactly. relationship with Joker. With yeah, Cortez, it... it's yeah. like, oh, hi, Mr. Cortez, you're new to my ship. In the third game, how much possible development, how, what kind of arc could you possibly get to make me interested? Which was the same thing with Vega. The only thing Vega had going for him was he had a lot, a lot of great conversations with other characters. Yeah, and that's one thing I did like about Mass Effect Three: the the fleshing out of the NPC dialogues between each other. Like Vega's little, uh, I don't know how to say it without sounding crass, but uh, the the dick measuring contest that Vega had with Garrus at one point on the third <laughs> the third level of the ship, where they're just trading badass stories back and forth. I felt that really. That was really awesome, but when you actually had a chance to talk to Vega one on one, he's kind of like, "Do you hear that hum?" Or, "I want to kick ass. I'm gonna go yeah, work he's, out." He's, 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 it's basically Freddie Prince Jr. Um, you know, being Freddie. I don't know. I, I thought mm -hmm. I thought it was funny though. I thought I thought for a character, he was basically the like, "Oh, I'm the human guy here," because Shepard's already been knee deep in aliens. Vega hasn't. So he's basically there to kind of play the, uh... The Ashley you know, one, almost. Yeah, kinda, well, yeah. I, I, I'd say that. I didn't really feel like he minded. I mean, he, he was more of a... a, a, a certainly a pro-alien uh, pro uh, kind of guy. He was always talking about how badass Krogan are in battle and how he had fought, fought with Krogan before and, uh, and stuff like that. Um, and he also... Um, he also filled the, the important role of having a soldier on the, on the team, just to sort of, sort of uh, skim the gameplay a little bit. Uh, because in every Mass Effect game, you had one of each class as a representative of the team members. Yeah. And, you know, you needed a soldier, and then, you know, he was... I, I don't want to say stereotypical, but if I were to think of what a soldier would be in, like, a super fantasticized universe, that would probably be him. Yeah, and I do have to admit, I do love the uh, the diversity that both Cortez and Vega brought in terms of their actual ethnicity to the game, which is nice. Yeah. Yeah. Although, Hispanic although, characters aren't stuff you see in gaming in general, unless you count the horrible Shadows of the Damned game. Although I don't think I enjoyed the uh, the frequent uh, the frequent uh, mixing of Spanish and English. Yeah, that was a bit trite. Yeah, yeah. it was a it was a little a little gratuitous. Um, hmm. You know, it, it really felt like uh, they were trying to... Uh, it, of course, it, it could have been a lot worse. I will say that. If it, it, it could have been a lot worse than what they had. True, true. To me, to me it felt like, hey, remember, this guy's Mexican. Just yeah. keep, hey, keep that in mind. At yeah. least you never said ese or uh, odele, because then you know it's a white guy writing a Hispanic. <laughs> yeah. uh. So let's see. Vega, meh, but he's better than Jacob. Uh, Cortez... Meh, but that's cause he because he was brought into the new game, uh, into the new game. Uh, what other new? Uh, the one character I well, really want to talk about that I absolutely despise and I have no idea why is in the game, other than some really, really, really misguided attempt at sort of I don't know what by Bioware is Dana Alters or Jessica Chobot. Oh, she, yeah, she's you completely know. optional, which is good, but. It is just so jarring to see, you know, the IG, uh, person fam uh, famed within the community as, you know, the face of IGN for at least a little while. And just, it, you can tell that they wanted to make her look as close to her real life persona as possible. But with the tools provided in Mass Effect, and it's kind of... Uh, uncanny Valley. Yeah, it's very Uncanny Valley, especially at the cheeks. This mm. is why you don't really want to import directly, direct faces into the Mass Effect universe. It's still, it's, it's quite more realistic than most games, but it still has that cartoonish edge that not, not uh, mention, Jessica just fell right into. Not to mention that horrible outfit. Horrible outfit, incredibly poor uh, voice acting. I, it wasn't not incredibly right, so. poor, it was just it was just kind of... Comparatively. Boring. Comparatively yeah. going into Mass Effect first, the, you're, are, you're going against some hot, top talent, and I don't know what direction Jessica was given, and she, normally she, you know, she has a great presence, but here it was just stilted. She may yep. have been very intimidated, but regardless, she shouldn't. She should not have been in there. She was complete. She should not have been in there. She what didn't do anything. I mean, she was complete. She was completely erroneous in terms of the effective military strength. She gave you five. Yeah. Five. Which, and, by the way, it turned out didn't matter at all anyway. So. Well, we'll get to that. But I mean, yeah, yeah you, you, the interviews you could take with her, or you, it could add to your EMS. But why did you have the really cool journalist character that you could punch? in the previous games, and in this game, come back and fill that same role. They could've. They easily could've. 
Uh, we know why Jessica Chobot's in there. Some demented fan service that wasn't really requested. I don't know. Did you hear it? That was that was EA. That? Just just whenever you see something like that that doesn't make any sense, just remember, EA is a shit company. <laughs> and they will do anything they can to just thrust whatever bullcrap they can in there to try and sell their games. But was anyone clamoring for Jessica Chobot? But I mean, I, mean, I don't, I don't know. Maybe people who subscribe to their origin she, service. She's she's this year's Miranda, though. I mean, remember, Miranda's also based on a real face and a real. Yeah, but at least that person. actually gelled better with the in-game with the in-game tools. Except for in three. I swear to God, there was some freaky Friday crap going on with Ashley and Miranda. I do not like Ashley's new character design. I don't like the evil oh, no. hairstyle. I don't like that they had to feed... I don't know why they felt they needed to, again, Sexy for lack of a better term, yeah, tart her up, if you will, uh, for lack of a better term. But I just felt it was distracting. And it, it didn't was. really necessarily reflect the change in her character, which she did have quite a lot of growth from the little bit I played in my uh, played elsewhere that she wasn't part of my uh, playthrough, my completed playthrough, but... I would've been okay with her letting her hair down in the ho like in the in in the uh, what's it called the hospital or in in civvies, but no, she's out. She's in comp her combat uniform with her hair hair down, which is completely against character. Against character, mm -hmm. against regulations, it's against military common sense. Considering that is covering one of her eyes, and also her uniform is unzipped down to the cleavage. Oh god. Well, I luckily killed her off in the first game, uh, <laughs> again, because she was luckily a we got big fundamentalist, yeah. but uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, wasn't she on the um, on the cover of the game? Uh, With, I got uh, the special edition, so I only have the N N7 logo. Yeah, I got the orange version as well, so I don't have the cover, but uh, I think I saw and, you know. a cover image of her and Shepard and some other character in the background. Would make sense, I suppose. Yeah. That's I. I would say that 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 alone is probably why they did it. Maybe. Uh, oh, do uh, do we want to count Edie as a new character, considering her body form and her uh, her increased? Uh, only only a, only as a new playable character and the effects that it had. Like, I, I would I would say that. I would say it's an expansion of the character from the second game. Yeah, and she has more personality as well now because she's unhinged, as it were, from the uh, AI shackles. I just felt it was. Uh, I loved her her arc, as as it were. I mean, the dis the discovery of a different mode of operation than what she, uh, you know the pre perceived uh, idea of organics is to live long enough to have sex and procreate. Yeah, Edie, the, Edie was there to basically say, okay, yeah. so you know how you wanted it Legion earlier on in the second game. Here you go. Here's Edie. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, also, I, like she, I, I, I feel like she was also a balancing point because the whole, the first two games spend their whole, all their time demonizing AIs and demonizing machines, basically, and she was sort of the counterbalance to that. But yeah. I thought they went too far. I mean, I don't, I don't consider myself to be a conservative individual, but the romance between Joker and Edie was never anything but creepy to me and very disturbing. Actually, See, I, didn't, I didn't mind. Yeah, I, I, I found it endearing in a certain way, because what, you could find it creepy only if you really, really felt like some uh, an AI could not be a human. Yeah. Um, also, only well, really... that kind of gives away my uh, most of my playthrough right then. Because ah. okay. I'm in that boat for most of the time. Yeah. Because, I don't know, I, I have this own personal philosophy that consciousness is just a bunch of data, and if you can reproduce that, then what the hell, why not? Uh, but, uh, you know, that sort of played to that, and I, I feel like, you know, her romance with, with uh, Jacob wasn't one of the Joker. physical, uh, j sorry, Joker, yeah, wasn't a physical one, it was more, you know, Joker being lonely and needing someone to talk to because he's stuck in the chair all the time, and then Edie being right there and things developing naturally. They had a lot of time to bond, yeah. That yeah. is definitely true. Yeah, I'm just wary of the singularity. So I'm I I am very reactionary when it comes to AI, and I realize that's coming from an odd place. But that's why it was disturbing to me. But I recognize it was well developed, just creepy to me personally. Yeah. The um, one character I want to talk about though is um, is the DLC character, the Protheum. Uh, oh called... yeah. Javik. Javik. Yeah. Javik. AKA the uh, the alien insect samurai. <laughs> yeah. He was a really cool character, if you ask me. I, I, I cannot fathom, or I can, but I, I, I don't want to, 
why he wasn't included in the main game because he had I such a I honestly I, think it was because they ran out of time before certification and they just kept working on it while the main game was certified. Right, yeah, that's exactly what happened. Um, that's And that's that's what they've said. The reason that it was not included in the main game, and again, you can blame EA for this. You can actually blame EA for something I'm about to get to later on in this. Um, they wanted the game to be released in the earlier part of this year. Um, so basically, to get the game done, they cut Javik and got the game as done as they possibly could. And then uh, once it went into bug testing, they started working on Javik. And by the time Javik was done, the game had already gone into certification and they yeah. had to just put him out as day one DLC. So, which is frustrating for people. I'm 100% I'm sure that's very frustrating for people, but they have to understand it's not Bioware's fault. They would have done it differently if they could. Also, it really it's, it's, a common, it's a common fault. Doesn't uh, Microsoft also have the uh, policy where you can't release really significant DLC without charging for it? I or sure. did they rid themselves of that? I don't know off the top of my head, but I'm very yeah. thankful that Javik was a much more developed and worthwhile DLC character than Zahid or Kasumi. Exactly. Oh, by far, by Both far. Which I was just. I mean, although to be fair, I think Javik was a bit more expensive in terms of DLC than both Kasumi and Zahid, not together, but mm. individually. Yeah, 800 uh, points, I think. But I think they did a much better job. He, obvi he obviously was a character meant to be included in the original game because they kept having these interactable moments with him. They kept uh, returning to him and having these more interactive dialogue scenes with him than just, you know, clicking on him and having him say something. You actually well, that's, got that's That's not voice. proof, necessarily, that he was supposed to be in the original game. That's, oh, that's all speculation, because at this point, uh, the benefit to doing the... Uh, DLC creation post production uh, allows them to still use the same people and the same crew that they had. Right. So yeah. there's there's no there's not necessarily any proof that he was supposed to be part of the original game. It's all just uh, you know speculation. All right. Everyone. This is this is definitely me going going off and assuming, but uh, I think there's pretty good evidence that there was at least an intent. But again, I'm uh, this is an assumption of mine based on the what? evidence. Well, I wanted to get back to what you were saying about uh, how, um, you know, characters had these sort of uh, conversations between themselves while you were just walking around. And I personally think that the conversations that Liara and Javik had were some of the best uh, in the game. Oh, yeah. Easily, easily. Yeah. Yeah. Hearing hearing all about the Prothean, about the Protheans, their race, and exactly how wrong Liara had gotten them. Or at least exactly. to the extent, or at least to the very extent of how Javik felt about all of it. Mm. I mean, um, we, we find out that they were a bit uh, em empirical, which is, you know, that's that's definitely different. But Javik's personality was definitely always going to jive against uh, Liara's, considering she, he was a soldier. And not only was he a soldier, he was a soldier in the worst possible time for them to have been soldiers. Right. Yeah, and, uh, and he was really a pragmatist, whereas Liara was an idealist. <laughs> so you know th those naturally clash. Yep, as uh, as as Gears would say, I mean Javik is very much in tune with the calculus of war, and whereas mm -hmm. Liara is very much, uh, I would say, yeah, idealistic to to a fault almost. Mm -hmm. Especially when it came to the Protheans. I mean, I almost felt that Liara's char uh, character uh, was more was better developed in the wake of Javik than Javik himself, just because. She, mm. It was almost a return to basics with her, considering this was a foundational element to her from the very start. Yeah, it yeah, was she, sort of funny in the second one where she became this "I'm a badass and I'm going to I'm going to hunt down the Shadow Broker." And it was always kind of like, "Wow, this is so cute." Yeah. It, it was it was it was surreal because in the first game she was this kind of like more naive, uh, young Asari. She was like only 123, but to her that's like barely 18 years old right. almost and that and and now she's this cold-blooded killer threatening to fillet people alive mm. yeah and that that kind of that kind of shifted again and back to back to the basics in mass effect 3 which i liked very much yeah. i don't think they are really gelled as that kind of reluctant badass or uh reluctant anti-hero character trope yeah whereas in the third one she really uh, i wouldn't say she returned completely back to form but she yeah. certainly found a middle point where she could fun function as a soldier and as as a warrior uh, but still have her idealistic human side well human is kind of wrong but uh 
Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah. But Javik Jav- Jav- as a character himself, I really liked. I lo- uh, everything, you know, voice acting was great. Character design was great. I love the the sort of evolution of the Drell concept in which memories could be passed back and forth in, uh, between, oh, yeah. between uh, any being, really, as long as you have mm-hmm. a knowledgeable Prothean or a knowledgeable being with Prothean uh, abilities. And I thought that was a really good device and utilized very well. Especially yep. in terms of the, uh, you had a Chekhov's gun with uh, Javik constantly through the entire game that I was waiting for, which is the memory shard. He had just floated in the uh, in the corner of the room that I knew was going to be uh, used. And that was his ultimate arc. That was his the climax of his development for the game. And I thought that was really well done. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. But I think, uh, but I think if we could, if I can move into the returning characters, and my probably my biggest narrative problem outside of what we're going to be talking about and what everyone's been talking about later, uh, is the use of the returning characters. And but in a way, this is Mass Effect Three is basically the game in which choice architecture came and bit Bioware on the ass. Because every returning character had to be put into a position that if they died in Mass Effect 2, they could be replaced with a generic similar character. So then you couldn't have really these intense character modes. You couldn't just visit, you know, uh, let's see, uh, you couldn't just visit Morden just in a lab somewhere typing and doing something specific and performing Gilbert and Sullivan. Because if Morden died in Mass Effect 2, in Mass Effect 3, you just get this generic soldier, uh, Solarian who dies doing the same thing Morden does. So they all had to be integrated into the game in which they could be also in, in a position which also could be absorbed by a generic NPC. So I think that really kind of forced a, a trite aspect into the narrative, whereas you have uh, all of these characters basically doing, you know, this um, hat and cane kind of tap dance across the screen cameo kind of deal. And mm-hmm. I, I, like, I'm not necessarily sure I agree with that, though. Go ahead. Well, um, um, how do you how do you think? I, I will say I will say the worst the worst offender there is probably with Morden, considering he's replaced. But I can't even remember the other guy's name. No, but he, I think it was the uh, the Solarian that like bitches about um, the the Krogan being on Circus when you first arrive, like that it, commander. I guess I don't even remember his name. No, no, it's not Commander Kira here. No, no, it's just, he's just a commander. Oh, I don't. I, awesome I, I actually, here. actually, I, I don't think it's a commander at all. There's actually another the scientist back there, um, who, who takes up the role of, of more than it's like Pillick or something. It does. It doesn't matter. Um, the, really, really, the only problem I found there was I. I wondered about that myself, and I will say Morden didn't get a whole lot of screen time. But the screen time he got near the end there, and 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 with the female Krogan, were so good. Mm-hmm. Like they they were all him. It really felt like it, even even like I don't know what you would have done if you didn't have more than there. Exactly. That's that's the, that's the problem is that if you didn't, it would just be that generic uh, that generic soldier. Brett would have been replaced by a generic Krogan. Uh, Garrus would. Well, no one's gonna like Paddock Garrett's Wicks. Spot, that's but... his name. Paddock Wicks. Ah, well done. Oh yeah. Well, I feel like it's almost like. I respect Bioware more because of that, because it's, it's like they trust us to make uh, our own choices and to suffer the consequences. Uh, yeah, the, the consequences just, being you're getting a stand-in character. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, what else should they, should they have done? Should they have completely reinvented the view and made a whole new character that was supposed to affect you the same way? It's, it's impossible. So, yeah. really what they did I'm is... Not- I'm not saying this is a failure on Bioware's part. I'm saying it's merely a a bump in the road in terms of in implementation of choice architecture that we, as an industry, have not really found a way to circumvent yet. Yeah, there is no there is no better option, and that's the problem. It's a side effect. It, it's exactly. a side effect that there. If I think if they had more time and money, maybe. But it, then it's like, well, what's at one point do you have uh, diminishing returns? I mean, at what point are, are you not gonna, are you really gonna make, are one, people gonna care enough, and uh, two, are they gonna pay, like, they're never gonna make the money off of the time and, you know, effort they'd spend trying to make another scenario where it makes sense that more than isn't there. Yeah. So, yeah, unfortunately, unfortunately, Paddock Wicks was their only option. Although, I will say this, I've actually seen the scenes with Paddock Wicks. He's actually kind of interesting. Um, he's obviously supposed to be a stand-in for Morden, but they don't try and necessarily make him like Morden, and that's what I like. 
I, again, I'm not saying that Bioware uh, did it did didn't do the best with what they had. They obviously did. I mean, I've I've had to research and uh, see all of the all the character replacements they used. I'm just arguing that as, as it's a systemic kind of handicap that is indicative of where where we're heading next in the next kind of uh, challenge we're going to have in terms of game development. Yeah, and I also think that uh, since since uh... You sort of sign on to this from the get-go. Everyone knew that Mass Effect was this game about choices, and the right. sequels would, you know, reflect the, the choices you made in the first games, uh, the first two games. I, I sort of think, uh, feel like, you know, Bioware sort of made their bed with this and said, yeah, whatever, let's just do it the way we planned all along, and and not really worry too much about all the little um, idiosyncrasies. Almost that's going to occur because of this. Yeah, which you know the the thing with Jacob I mentioned earlier is a perfect example example of that. Right. I mean, yeah. The, uh, what they've done. I mean, this is still the only major franchise to use such. Uh, I mean, to be so ambitious in terms of cross uh, cross game co compatibility and there and a serious serial narrative. I mean, yeah. can you, can you, I don't even think any other game has really used the imported save data function. Anywhere of, towards Mass Effect quality. Plenty of games use like different choices in in a in a series of games, and but instead of uh, you know importing the same and actually having those choices affect you, either they give you a test basically, saying you know what did you do, or uh, in that case it's usually not very many options, right. or they sort of make a one shoe fits all sequel. Exactly. Which... I mean, yeah, exactly. I mean, by Mass Effect 3, you have to have at least hundreds of little variables that yeah. are being imported into the game. And it's it's still mind boggling just how, uh, how they managed to even complete the project at this degree, let alone to the to the degree that they've done it. Mm. Yeah. But, but I want to move on and talk about uh, the actual story itself and primarily the ending. All uh, right. Do, okay. you, do you guys want to say something about that? Uh, well, do you oh. want to start with the ending, or just do a kind of overview of the story first? Because we haven't really gone point by point. Uh, that's true, that's true. Whichever feels more natural, basically. Um, I, I think I we wanna... really should end off with the ending, because there's going to be some serious discussion there. Let's hold it, let's tease it a little bit more. Yeah, yeah, good idea. Alright, so so personally, I felt like um, in, in Mass Effect 3, as opposed to Mass Effect 2, and, and even more so in Mass Effect 1, uh, all the story moments, or all the big moments in the story, had so much more weight to it, and so much more, at least up until the ending, had so much more weight and, and urgency to them, because you knew that, that Earth was currently being slaughtered, and that, you know, the, the galaxy was in peril, and, and, and the visuals and what happened around you sort of reflects that, where you almost always see a reaper off in the distance, you know, killing a bunch of people or 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 some huge catastrophe, you know, on, on the horizon. It really helped they... that this was this was end game. This was the final chapter in the entire series. And so at this point they're like, okay, you know what? We can go balls to the wall with everything here. We can mm. make we can make all the choices mean like the life or death of an entire race. Um, because that was that was yeah, intense. Mm. And one of my one of my favorites, and like, is is the decision you make with the get. Yep. That could have been like I've seen I've seen what happens if the Quarians are destroyed. It's heartbreaking. Yeah, I kind of didn't see the Paragon option for that, so my playthrough kind of ended with both the the Quarians destroyed and both Legion and Tally dying, and it was very very sad. Oh, oh wow! And very, That's and I was I was really I was mind boggled because I never saw it, and this game does not necess necessitate a certain level of reputation to use the Paragon or Renegade options. So I don't know where I missed it, but I must have. Well, also, I was gonna... yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, also, I don't know. It could have been just my playthrough. It could have been another one of these little trip ups that Moss was talking about with Jacob. But uh, usually, I mean. From Mass Effect 1 to Mass Effect 3, the layout of the dialogue wheel is upper option, Paragon, bottom option, Renegade. Middle option, neutral, neutral, if you will. But I thought uh, when I was 
given the decision to either save or destroy the Rachni Breeder, I chose the top option, which I thought was Paragon, but I got Renegade's, Renegade points for it. Did that, did that happen to you guys too? Yeah, and it also it also seems like, um, you know, the the choice of the, di the little uh, snippet of, of the dialogue that it actually shows when you make the choice doesn't always reflect uh, accurately what you think it should. Exactly, so, it's not a real big indicator of what you're actually yeah. going to do. Yeah. Which, which usually nine nine times out of ten works towards the game's advantage because if you had all the dialogue options fully visible, it leads to kind of boring progression since you well, know exactly I, what you're going to say. But well, I, the vagueness didn't help in that sense. Well, I feel like you know at, at, at some points you're giving a, you're given a choice between a bunch of insults and the cold hard truth. And usually, you'd think, you know, the insults were the renegade one, and uh, the cold hard truth were, would be the paragon. Or, you know, maybe it was glossed over a little, a little bit uh, to make it more polite. But sometimes it's just the opposite. Sometimes um, Shepard takes this moral high ground, and that's suddenly the, the, the paragon way of doing things, instead of... Um, Instead of the the lower option, or sometimes even the top option, where you know it would be something a bit more understanding of the situation and a bit more sim sympathetic, where where suddenly the sympathetic version is the renegade option. Yeah, that that happened one or two times, but I think one of the reasons that those were sometimes put as the renegade option is that the people you're trying to sympathize with may not be good people, or their decisions might not actually be the very good decision. Yeah. Um, and in some of those cases, it also seems a little underhanded from Shep, like he's lying to them. Right. Mm. Uh, exactly. I see where they're going from a narrative sense, and that does it does work even if they purposely switch the design of the narrative circle. But I'm just arguing from a design perspective, it, it kind of goes counterintuitive to what we've been trained to do at the uh, up until this I've point. I've never I've never had the problem where the top oh, okay. option was Paragon. Then, then yeah. I, okay. Well, actually, well, no. That case. was there was this one time I can't remember specifically, but I remember picking it. I was like, "What the hell did I just do?" Mm. <laughs> it uh, may have been a glitch on my part then. So in that case, yeah. that's the case. I apologize, by the way. But but I want to get back to you know the the uh, major story. major story uh, yeah, story yeah. developments. Um, uh, I, I want to continue talking about because what I actually did with the get is I saved them and uh, I made sure that they would allow the um, Quarians to come back to the home planet and just the the story arc where Legion takes you through and and shows you you know the past of what happened to the get and how the uprising quote began and. Um, I felt that was really touching, actually, and I, I, it sort of humanized the Geth to a degree where just after seeing that, I couldn't possibly have chosen the other, the other option, the Renegade option. Yeah, the the idea of the the fully re realized AI part both frightened me and really made me want to like help them succeed because at that point mm. it's like you really are people, and we yeah. have no right to try and kill you, especially now that we've found out that. You may have driven them away from your homeworld, but you actually made the effort to leave them be afterwards. They had no intention of, uh, of pursuing the Quarians post that ordeal. In fact, if the Quarians had tried to contact the Geth and negotiated, they probably could have worked out a deal earlier. The yeah. Geth were non-hostile. It was the Reapers that was causing all that bullshit. Yeah, and the, the, uh, the, the group of the Geth that sort of splintered off and joined the Reapers were... Uh, like a, a drop in the ocean compared to the actual population of the Geth. Yeah, the heretics that you could rewrite at the end of Mass Effect 2. Yeah. yeah. Right, right. And, and that just that that part inside the Tron world uh, just kind of more scary to me than uh, endearing. But yeah, it was a definite narrative high point for the game. It was extremely well done, especially given the sparse way in which the narrative was presented. It wasn't in the shot reverse shot narrative panel kind of routine that they normally do for a story it's in a point in which you have to focus on a i would say about 60 percent of the screen and it's all done in holographic projection in which you're not focused properly and you're looking at it from a sort of downward perspective yeah you're a spectator. really really well done yeah it's sort of like you're a specter reviewing the past <laughs> exactly. and you know the uh, the the decision to have shepherd at the bottom focusing up uh gives uh, in terms of a filmic sense gives it a sense of lack of power on Shepard's part which I mm. thought was very narrative, uh, narratively relevant and extremely extremely well done
And I also think the, the whole thing just works that much more because in the first game you just slaughter Geth indiscriminately. Oh, yeah. By the buckets. And, and, and you don't really know anything about them in the first game. You know that they were made by the Koreans and they had an uprising uh, where they threw the Koreans out of their home world. You don't really get the other side of the argument. So you spend the whole, um, whole first game and most part of the second game blind to the other side of, of the conflict. And just the way they bring that home in the third game is just, I don't know, it, 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 it was probably the most significant major mission uh, or whatever you want to call it in, 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 this, in the third game for me. I, I think in that same vein, I was really impressed with how they brought the Krogan into, into the universe more fully formed in Mass Effect 3. <clears throat> Up until this point, especially before you actually go on Tachanka, uh, the game actually seems to be leading you, or at least it was from my perspective, to the belief that the Krogan were these people that were raised out of barbarism too fast, and they're uh, naturally aggressive, and they're not really capable of going towards a civilized way route. That was the way I felt they were presented up until the point in which you actually went on to Chanka and you saw the ruins and you saw art and you saw Cro uh, you saw Krogan plant life and you saw the ruins of what they were and that it was almost as if you were lied to by everyone else in the universe up until that point. And yeah, you also by the Krogans, which was the main, main main thing for me. And once you see that, you also start thinking about how that's exactly the way uh, most of the galaxy viewed humans when they first arrived exactly. at, the Cit uh, at the Citadel. Whereas we, you know, at that point, what, what was it, uh, what, 2172 or something? Yeah, so about way more advanced than we are now. And uh, <laughs> and you sort of think, well, if, if that's how we developed, and, you know, that's the point where we started to branch out, even though we weren't uplifted by the Salarians, right. uh, we still were primitive compared to the other races and you see how fast that can change you know how fast human beings are integrated into quote citadel society yeah and I actually i really did love the development that we got for those races that we originally thought uh were uh, that we thought we had these like negative preconceptions for like the geth the krogan and i love the how they time. just they brought down the asari that was, man, I don't know why I was so satisfied with that. Oh, we, the, we all know it was satisfied. Uh, the entire yeah. game series, they had sticks up their ass, like gal galactic stick-up ass syndrome. I mean, and, and then yeah, we it was out, so cool. They, we find out that they that the entire time they were having their hand held by a Prothean ARVI. And they were like, those insidious little blue bastards. <laughs> It, yeah. it was actually it was it was a surprise. That was probably the biggest surprise reversal. You could expect human Krogan. You, you yeah, expect, yeah, yeah, uh, for lack of a better yeah. term, humanization of the Krogan and the Geth. They were hinting at it, but the Asari reveal just came out of just, nowhere. It's like just hoarding Prothean tech and using it towards the advancement of your civilization civilization at the expense of all others. That was fascinating. That was just completely out of the blue. It, one of my sorry. one of my favorite parts was. Uh, oh, sorry. But I feel like they didn't go too far either because they made it very clear that only a handful of Asari actually knew about this and were taking part in this. So the rest uh, were innocent of it. So I feel like they didn't go too far and, and you know, sort of alienate the entire race. Yeah, the only people who knew were the, um, oh, what were they called? The uh, matriarchs. matriarchs. Yeah. yeah. And only a so few they... of them knew. Yeah, probably Samara didn't even know from the second game. When she was yeah, it's, yeah, it's actually probable Samara didn't know. Samara would have probably made her, caused a shit. Yeah. Yeah, the Justicar and all that. But you were saying, Kaiser, your favorite part of it? We kind of just off. Oh, my, my favorite part of that entire scene is just as, as you were going around, if you bring Garrus, he just keeps making these smart-ass remarks. <laughs> oh, looks like, like I was so I was so pissed that I didn't bring Garrus for that. I brought Javik and Liara. Oh, Liara. Yeah, I did, anyway, I brought I did the same. Garrus Gar just starts making these remarks. Hmm, it looks uh, I guess uh, it's another picture of that Prothean. I mean, a uh, sorry. <laughs> he's, Javik he's, he's just, just... Javik was right. even more kind of uh, holier than thou. It's like, oh yeah, hey, it's all our stuff. Well done, a sorry. Yeah. I have him as well. Um, <laughs> Again, um, to cut you off. It seems to be a habit of ours. Sorry, go ahead. It's okay. Well, uh, you, were, you, were you were doing some more Garrus commentary. Uh, no, no, I, I, I'm, I'm done. Ah, <laughs> uh, okay. 
Here's right. awesome. the end. Well, I hate to rein it in, and I know there's probably a lot more we would like to talk about about the story, but we have to get to the ending before this yeah, thing Yeah, yeah, let's, let's, let's get... There's that. Everyone is probably... <laughs> Everyone's waiting for it. Yeah. yeah. So, um... So, first uh, of all, which yeah. one did you pick? <laughs> okay. Uh, go ahead, Scott. I, at, first, at first, I actually picked the control ending, because to myself, I was thinking, well, okay, um, I don't want to kill the Geth, because, like, I like the Geth now, so I guess I'll pick control, and so I picked control, and then I was, and then I saw the rest of the ending, and then I was like, I am not satisfied whatsoever. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, yeah. I personally just uh, immediately uh, after he hearing the uh, AI or whatever it is out, I picked the, the middle one where you integrate into the, I don't know, cosmic intelligence or whatever you want to call it. Space and magic. sort of Space magic, basically. <laughs> Everything becomes synthetic, basically. Every living thing becomes synthetic. How Partly. that works. Yeah, a new part, yeah. DNA, because that makes sense. Yeah, because <laughs> that's how DNA works. Oh, oh, actually, and here's the here's the best part. When actually the ship crash lands on the planet, and you see the foliage uh, where the camera pans down, it all has little uh, circuits on them. Oh it, God, oh. they do, don't they? Yeah, yeah. 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 No, that. Uh, no, see, this I, I, is. Uh, I chose a destroy okay. ending, so we have one of each ending, which is pretty cool. Well, I, I actually I went ending. back I went back and we didn't destroy after that. And nothing of value was changed. Except, except one part where uh, Shepard wakes up alive back on Earth. Oh, well that's only if you get like uh, a high... Yeah, that's if, if, you, right? if, you, if, you have, if you have between 4,000 and 5,000 um, with 100%, uh, what's it called? 100% flag of readiness. Yeah. Or if you have 5,000 or over. It's four, between 4,000 and 5,000 if you save Anderson. And... 5,000 plus, regardless of whether or not you save Anderson. Ah. Nice. But. Well, okay, let's start. Um, Kaiser, you and I have both discussed the indoctrination fan theory that has resulted in the wake of the endings to some pretty good length. I mean, do you do you think you could summarize it? Because I'm trying to recall the entirety oh. of it in my head, and I'm it's right. really complex. Okay, to, I'll, I'll give a basic overview so we don't run long. The indoctrination theory is basically a theory come up by a couple of people really in the Mass Effect franchise, uh, pulling from hundreds of different fans and their input on this theory, which was that post the uh, post the scene where Laser uh, uh, Shepard gets hit with the laser from I believe it was Harbinger, right. Shepard wakes up, he finds his way to the beam, has that conversation with Anderson, um, she, and she, she, it's important. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. <laughs> when when Shepard finds their way, <laughs> it, uh, you know, basically everything after Shepard gets hit with that laser is apparently, to uh, uh, according to this theory, a dream, or it, at the very least, one gigantic hallucination for Shepard. And there's actually a lot of evidence, or at least you know, at, at least you know, quote evidence that supports this. Um, right. A couple of them being the fact that a lot of what Shepard says doesn't sound right. A lot of it, it seems kind of out of character, or at least, at the very least, poorly written. All of the decisions, when looked at under a microscope, make no sense. A lot of the, uh, a lot of what the kid says makes no sense. Like, it actually contradicts several things in the story. Um, Synthetics and, will always try to destroy organics, just like the Geth that you just reunited with the Koreans on their home planet. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That, that was mind-bogglingly stupid. Um, one of the things that really bothered me about, you know, and that's the exact same thing I thought when I was playing through. I didn't even have to have a theory to point that one out to me. I was like, everything he says sounds wrong. And that's one of the reasons I hated the ending, because all of it just sounded so wrong. Um, right, but, but uh, just one quick... I don't know if it's a correction or not, but it's not just a hallucination. It's uh, Shepard fighting off the final stages of Reaper indoctrination. Well, yeah, is what, I, I, is I what was the about... final sequence is. Okay. Yeah, Sorry. yeah. I, I was going to get to that. Um, basically, the theory, uh, the theory puts forth that everything there, the conversation he has with Anderson and the elusive man, are two parts of his mind. Anderson being the part that is fighting indoctrination, 
the last humanity left in him and the elusive man being uh you know the indoctrination trying to take hold of him um that's and I, i'll bring up a piece of evidence here uh for the indoctrination theory one that one that is incredibly hard to ignore one that uh, like you know this this is one of the ones that i noticed my first time playing through and it really bothered me because it, it just made no sense to me it's the it's it's probably what i'm thinking of right now when Please when shepherd shoots anderson yep suddenly there's a hole in shepherd's side exactly there's no, where there, they shot anderson right yeah it makes no sense and the only and the only possible explanation is that this isn't real and that that was just an injury to his own psyche which makes a per which makes perfect sense mm -hmm. um and especially since when he wakes up if you if you have enough ems and if you you know if you save anderson or if you have enough ems to where it doesn't matter and if you pick the destroy ending the destroy ending which by the way contradicts anything that the reapers would want actually want yeah, to the point where wakes, why would they even present it as an option? Yeah, he wakes up in the rubble, and that's not Citadel rubble. One, it looks like the atmosphere is exactly like London. First off, second, the uh, it's it's all rubble, it's all concrete and and metal. Not none of the none of the synthetic, you know, none of the materials that make up the Citadel. Mm. I mean, there is, there's a lot of little details that come in and seem conspiratorial when discussed at length. But, I mean, in terms of the grand arc, arcing theme, the indoctrination theory is the most sound thing I've seen coming out of that ending. I mean, even if, it, if the endings are meant to be taken as large, grandiose metaphors rather than any sort of series of actual events, they still contradict each other and, more importantly, reflect inaccuracies in the mythos up until the point in which the exact scene prior to the showdown with the star child as it's known in the fan community also uh, i would i would even add more evidence to this when when you get uh, i don't know if it's harbinger or harbinger or whoever shoots you with a laser when you, uh, yeah yeah when when you approach the portal you have two teammates with you and those two teammates, that actually determines who who you have with you determines the ending, because those two teammates are teammates are the ones that walk out with a Joker on the ship. Which uh, that's the another planet. part that makes no yeah. bloody sense. Didn't they die? Or yeah. if yeah. they did, how they just how did they suddenly get aboard the Normandy when that was a hot zone and he couldn't possibly pick them up? And why was he flying away? Why was especially why in the in the since this is ending in which nothing would be destroyed and metal and metals wouldn't and the synthetics the Normandy isn't an a synthetic being so it would not be affected by the explosion. Yeah, yeah. But more, I mean, there's a thousand little factors here. Once you're hit with a laser, the bushes that were in your dream sequences are all around you where they weren't previously. Your armor is blasted off, and yet the laser did not do any structural damage to your face. Um, oh, Star there's, a, there's uh, another yeah. part. There's another part that that bothered me the moment I saw it. Um, after you're hit with the laser, you know the facial scarring that you get in two? Yeah. Mm. If you had no facial scarring in three at all, you have those scars when you're knocked out. Mm. Hmm. That bothered yeah, me. Yeah, I chose, I chose to fix those scars with the medical upgrade. Yeah, I never had any. And so when I saw them, I'm like... Those don't look like wounds. Those look like those scars that you get if you play a renegade. Right. And that bothered me. That bothered me significantly. I I, I was actually like, can I change that? That's not... Yeah, that looks horrible. <laughs> but I think, I mean, there's so many different points we can bring up here. But the main thesis I'm coming here is I'm not 100% in the group that says the indoctrination theory is correct and was planned by Byra and is evidence of an of the actual ending as opposed to what was presented my theory of uh, my my concern is it's either the indoctrination theory in which by all logic they do not give us an actual ending what you see is the best the best outcome that what can come out can, is yeah. yeah is Shepard uh resisting resisting indoctrination but still waking up in the rubble of a battle in which reapers are still taking place so that you you basically disregard the entirety of the ultimate battle which was advertised or b it's what's presented and in that case it's bad writing not just bad writing but writing that would not work in the bioware offices
This is no. not these these guys have proved this. And even if it's just the lead writers, which is a rumor that was going around that just locked themselves in a room and barred anyone else from contributing, every single writer on the Bioware team, even if they wrote a, wrote a single line for an NPC character that was never used again, they are at a better level than this. The amount of contradictions in place, the amount of just disregard for the Mass Effect lore up until that point, almost at the level of that Deception book that came out uh, a while ago and just got <laughs> the entire thing wrong. Bioware dug themselves into a hole in which there is no way to get out without breaking a few limbs. They don't well, have a good win scenario. This is lose, lose, or well, be horrible. Pers personally, I, I, I believe that there's a rumor going on um, that I, I actually be led to believe that in April... Like, um, and this rumor was coming, it was around since before, uh, that director of bio, I can't remember what his name is, came out and literally said, we're going to, you know, expand upon the ending in April. The rumor was, in April, we're going to get a DLC called The Truth, which is a DLC expansion of the ending, which is going to take place post the ending, um... That is going to explain every. That is going to explain things, and it's going to. And it's. Uh, and according to this rumor, it's going to be huge. Like every. Like apparently, it's a much, much bigger difference, a significant difference in terms of what kind of ending you'll get, depending on what you chose. Okay, um, but even if that in, in, even if that DLC is free, the problem is if the indoctrination is true, and this in, this DLC is coming to counter it and work it like. Uh, and adding on to that, they still sold within a package an incomplete product. An I, incomplete and, oh, remember when I said I'd come back to this? Yes. Okay. So, back in November, there was a. I believe it was in, in, uh, last November. There was a leak of the. Uh, there was a leak of the ending. This actually required them to change some things. And they had oh. to go back and fix a lot uh, to try and change things up. Yeah, I remember some kerfuffle about. Um... Or was it last March? But yeah, yeah. It, it was a while ago. I, 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 uh... Yeah. Anyway, so... and I remember some kerfuffle about people complaining about the ending and how there was some sort of petition out to change it, even way before the game was released. Yeah. Um, so. And also, EA wanted this game out in this, like the. Uh, what was it first, first quarter? quarter? First, first quarter. quarter. Yeah. They were demanding it. Again, right. I hate. I do not like EA. I can never say enough bad things about Electronic Arts. So I hope you guys aren't funded by them because I think they're a bunch of assholes. <laughs> um, if we were funded by EA, we'd have you know we'd be much bigger than we are right now. I'm just yeah. saying. I'm just saying. I, I'm. I'm hoping you're not worried about offending any fans of theirs or. No, 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 no. That, yeah. EA no, rail, them. rail and rant, man. That's that's yeah. awesome. Keep it, keep it no. coming. E e um, EA took, you know, control of the NFL franchise video games, which is total bullshit. The monopoly on the, that should never have happened. Um, they're everything they've done with Bioware is made mistake after mistake, forcing them to make stupid decisions. Um, Dragon Age Two, did I say more? Dragon Age Two, yeah, and um, ultimately, this I I had I have blamed the ending on EA. Because they forced them to get the game out before they actually had their ending done. That's why it's even coming out as DLC to begin with. Well, I will say though that if it turns out that uh, Bioware actually did uh, intend for this to be the final ending, and they're just now going back on it because they are seeing their reaction, number one, they are in incredibly naive because they should have seen that this would piss people off from the moment they wrote it. And number two, um, even though I'm not a huge fan of EA, I kind of don't want to blame them directly before we have all of the facts on the table. I, I, well, here's the thing. I just I mean, believe too much in Bioware, is all. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, and I do, I do see, you know, Kaiser is coming from a point of, uh, he, he, EA has made a series of decisions in which they have claimed creative ownership up until this point that could lead to pretty strong theorizing of who is behind the ending. Precisely, like with Dragon again with Dragon Age Two, we know oh, that was because yeah. of EA. Yeah. But we just, but we just want to make sure that you know this is still we're not a hundred percent confirmed, but we're pretty damn close. But my my whole problem yeah. is that Bioware still released it, so I cannot completely scrub them of fault. Because also, if these are the intended endings, they're just badly written. 
I mean, well, they're Again, just here's the thing. I hate the Star Child. I hate children. I hate the children that are shoved into a story for pathos, and that's all the kid was. If, if he's not meant to be a representative of Shepard's psyche or the final indoctrination of the Reapers, if he does not have a larger point, he is pathetic pathos, and it's yes, it, it's, I, it's I agree. Hard. I agree. The, the endings as they stand, unless the indoctrin the indoctrination theory is the only possible way to make any of that tolerable. I'm, I'm calling bullshit anyway, though, because uh, I'm just gonna cut you off a little bit. Because even if, even if all the indoctrination stuff is true and there is some a planned DLC, free or other ways for for April that will really end the the trilogy. Even if that, even if all that is true, at least they could have made a different ending cinematics for uh, cinematic for each. I mean, it's the same. Yeah, I, I'll, thing. I, I'll, I'll I'll agree. That was different that was a little slogans. frustrating. Um, I, I guess I guess the only reason behind that there there are probably three, or, or at least two really big reasons behind that. The first being money, um, producing oh. completely different ending cinematics probably would have cost them a decent amount, and two, they didn't want you to really enjoy or get, you know, as much as I hate to say it, it if the indoctrination theory is true, it actually makes more sense for them all to have been the same. Yep, I mean, I, I was saying, I agree with you. If the indoctrination is true, there is just an absolute glory to, uh, a certain glory to Bioware's future site here. Because even if they were just trolling the entire fan base or the entire community, it is one masterfully created goading of an ending. I mean, that's really, it's well, exceptional in that regard. You can but, bring it to Go ahead, you, could bring, you could bring in the argument that, you know, why would Shepard imagine uh, evil choices being represented as red, neutral being green? Indoctrination, and remember? Being green. Indoctrination. Green. Yeah, it's not so much a dream as it is indoctrination. But yeah, I don't yeah. know, I just don't see why she would differentiate that. Well, no, that's yeah. the point. The, the, the problem is, it's not just her. It's not just her imagining, okay, that must be the right choice. Uh, or is it control? Or is it this new option? She's not the one who's thinking about. Remember, her yeah, decisions yeah. are being colored by indoctrination. That's the mm -hmm. entire point of that. I mean, like, so so ultimately, the indo again, it makes sense that she would think the option that the indoctrination would make her think that the option to destroy the Reapers is the bad one. Right. Right. I mean, yeah. yeah, that's why the, the elusive man was shown in the paragon blue form. Um, all right, guys. I'm afraid we're gonna have to end uh, the show there. Uh, we would probably all like to talk about this for another two hours, but uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. We, we're we're not uh, able to do that, I'm afraid. Uh, but you guys can expect to see more spoiler alert uh, coming down the path uh, as new games come out. Uh, if there's any game you would imagine would work for this format, then we're probably gonna do it. And if for some reason we don't. Feel free to suggest so in the comments uh, and let us know what we should play and talk about. Uh, we'll have different guests on uh, every show, uh, but for now, thank you very much to Gavin Green uh, and a special thank you to Kaiser for uh, jumping in and uh, helping us out with this uh, first uh, first new episode. Thank you for having me. You want to drop a last plug for your uh, for your show? Yeah, Reader? sure. Um, you can find Dragon Ball Z Abridged on YouTube at Team Four Star. All right. Okay. Bye, guys. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much. Later, guys.